in preparation of further studies. Of course, German language proficiency was most important. Therefore, we used German which, with each other to help them to improve their language skills. But, of course, they used Bahasa Indonesia when talking with each other. These were my first encounters with Bahasa Indonesia. So, what did I learn about the language without learning the language? Next. It was about 40 years, la 40 years later when I recognized that I had already learned something about Bahasa Indonesia. I got a job as a German academic exchange lecturer at Universitas Indonesia in the field of German language and literature. Obviously, I had intuitively understood how they talk to each other, how they react towards each other, their face expressions and gestures, their body language, and the intonation and prosody in different situations. This was my hidden knowledge about Bahasa Indonesia when I started to learn the language in 2009. Next. So, uh, when I signed the job contract in early 2009, I was challenged to acquire language skills before my departure to Indonesia. How did I approach the language? How did I start to learn the language after I got to know that I had the chance to work in Indonesia, offered to learn the language systematically, but unfortunately the schedule did not fit with other duties I had at that time. So the embassy arranged with a stu an Indonesian student from the Technical University of Berlin for teaching. She had just begun her studies and was keen to improve her German language skills. We found it a tandem. She taught Bahasa Indonesia and I offered a German language training, but her field of studies was a technical subject and she did not have any experiences in language teaching. Our lessons were more very much built on spontaneous decisions with regard to content and methods, in a way unplanned language acquisition. Furthermore, I visited a seminar for Bahasa Indonesia at another university in Berlin, the Humboldt University. But this was for the second semester students and I was a complete beginner. Both these facts meant that I didn't learn the language systematically in Berlin, but in a fragmentary and volatile way, in short, in an unsystematic way. Next. Shortly after my arrival, in Indonesia in July 2009, I started having regular language classes, intensive one-to-one -one lessons, systematically getting started on simple structures, going forward to more complex phenomena. It was a 14-day course with five hours a day. This one-to-one -one concept was very helpful. I could already use the vocabulary which I had learned in Berlin. And at the same time, I could fill the existing gaps in the field of grammar. Aside from this, the one-to-one -one classes allowed, allowed me to ask all the questions I wanted to ask about grammar or the cultural background of language phenomena. The teachers were very polite and responded with comprehensive information at the school. During the next semester, 2009-2010, I continued learning Bahasa Indonesia in an online course one or two times a week. I expanded my vocabulary knowledge as well as my grammar knowledge. At the end of the semester in January 2010, I attended another five days one-to-one -one intensive class and finished the A2 level and proceeded to B1. At that time, I had already lived in Jakarta for six months. All the classes had been very helpful to cope independently with everyday life and face a number of challenges successfully. Next. 
it was especially intriguing that not on, I not only could use the language, but I could, at least partly, understand what other people in public were talking about. The conversation of the local Indonesian people in public transportation weren't like silent movies anymore to me. It was as if a door had opened. The sounds reached my ears and I understood what was going on next to me. I did not feel excluded anymore. In the classroom at university, classroom communication while teaching German language and literature, I recognized what I have mentioned before. The early contact with Indonesian language and people from the beginning of the early 70s provided me with the familiarity with facial expression and gesture. The familiarity with body language, facial expression, gesture, intonation and rhythm of the language facilitated certainly the access to the language, which is not surprising as we know that researchers found out in the early 70s as well that nonverbal communication contributes to a successful communication by 80%. Now I resume my experiences on what facilitates learning Bahasa Indonesia for me. Next. A. The early contact with the language and speakers. The language B. A language encounters in unsystematical language acquisition situations. C. One-to-one -one intensive classes. After all, there is a very important fact to be considered before I will turn to the hard facts of the language. Indonesian people are very sociable in communication. This makes it easy to a certain level to learn the language. Very often, Indonesian people address strangers. Taxi drivers always ask about the passenger's origin, the country of origin, special things like football or cars from Germany or technical term items in general. Or they talk about family, meals and food or school or in, uh, university in Germany and so on. As soon as they, the taxi drivers or somebody else in Indonesia recognizes that the guest knows a little bit Bahasa, they continue asking questions and make big efforts to get what the passenger might say. They will help you to improve your language skills by correcting the pronunciation or the grammar. This kind of communicative behavior makes a major contribution to the language acquisition I experienced. You are not left alone while learning the language. On the contrary, you can repeat what you have learned with quite a number of different partners, which provides a high, high training effect. Furthermore, Indonesian people have a high thought tolerance. Nobody feels ashamed if a foreigner makes a mistake. They make big efforts to understand what strangers with a bad pronunciation might mean when they have not yet understood what the stranger intends to say. Now I will turn to what I called the hard facts of the language. Next. Why does it seem to be easy to learn Bahasa Indonesia? Whether it really is a language which is easy to learn depends on the ling linguistic proximity between two or more languages or one's mother tongue and Bahasa Indonesia. With respect to phonetics, most aspects of pronunciation are easy to practice. If, for example, your mother tongue is a Western European language, for example, the R sounds very similar to the Spanish or Southern German pronunciation. The next thing is the typeface. The typeface that not, does not cause problems as the so-called Latin letters uh, were introduced to Bahasa Indonesia in the 1940s. 
aside this aside of this, there are structural similarities in word formation between Bahasa Indonesia and the German language. This I would like to demonstrate with an example. Next, I choose uh, the the example Tingal. Tingal means in German bleiben, in English stay or remain. Um, we have uh, in uh, German and in uh, Bahasa Indonesia, the word have a kernel or a root syllable. A prefix or a suffix defines the meaning of a word. When we have the same structure in uh, Indonesian language and German language. For example, tingal, you have tingal, you have meningal, which has a very different meaning. You have peningalan, you have tertingal. In German, we have bleiben, bleib. Bleib is the kernel, the root syllable. And for meningal, which means somebody dies, passed away, we have a word. Uh, for meningal, the word in German is sterben. That is very different to die. But in the context of the situation, if somebody dies, we have another word which contains the syllable bleib. The vowels, they differ a little bit, but it's a speciality in our language. Um, the persons who remain behind, the family members and the, the friends, we call them die Hinterbliebenen, those who still stay on earth. Um, the same is uh, Peningalan. Uh, this is what uh, the person who dies left behind. Um, for this, we usually say Erbe, which is different from Bleiben, but we have uh, for things that stay behind, uh, we have another word with Bleiben, über Bleibsel. So we have the um, prefix über and the suffix sel, and in the middle, the kernel, the root syllable is Bleib. So it's very similar to in Bahasa Indonesia. Tertinga, the next example. That exactly has the translation zurückbleiben, übrig bleiben. So we have another prefix zurück and the um, a suffix en, which is the indicator for um, the basic form of the ver verb. And we have übrig and en. Uh, and it has the same meaning as tertingal, something that remains, still remains, or is a little bit like um, the rest of something. These structural similarities, like uh, it, uh, this, make it easy to learn a language if you have enough time to explore such similarities. So you, these similarities um, are like bridges to um, encode a language. Next. Because of the sound of the language, the pronunciation, the word structure and word formation, Bahasa Indonesia is a language that is easy to learn for Germans. This communicative be behavior of Indonesian help you to learn the language. The narrative speaker's openness is an essential aspect of facilitating language acquisition. This precondition is widely provided for in Indonesia. With this, I will turn to my next point. Next, uh, to the difficulties, uh, difficult aspects of the language and the courses which I experienced. Uh, which phenomena cause problems? These are such grammatical phenomena which include cultural and societal values and ideas, as well as the organization of interpersonal relationships. Such grammatical phenomena express common ideas and values which differ from the language learner's cultural background and knowledge. It is important here, if ever possible, to talk with the teachers and explore together the social conceptual world which shapes the underlying grammar phenomena. Such a discussion and discovery will facilitate the understanding of grammatical constructions. In the exchange with my teachers, I gained important insight into the language and the culture of Indonesia. Next. 
So I, I'll give an example. It was really very hard uh, to understand for me why I was learning the language at the language school. Uh, the verb or word ambil. Uh, you have the word meng ambil kann and you have the word memory. Ambil uh, means in German nehmen or in English to take. Uh, memory means given or to give. Um, and meng ambil kann expresses the idea to do something for somebody. But this is not expressed in an autonomous grammatical form in German language. So I wondered when I read the sentence, Ani Mungambilkan Bapaknya, sorry, Kachamata. Um, in German, we would say, or in English, Annie gives the glasses to her father. This was, would mean we would use, as a German or English native speaker, we would use Ani Memberi Kachamata Gupada Bapaknya. But this is not correct in Bahasa Indonesia. So the idea in Bahasa Indonesia is um, the first part of the right side. Ani takes the glasses and passes them to her father. Ani nimmt die Brille, um sie ihrem Vater zu geben. And it took me really a while to get this idea of Mengambil um, Khan. So I discussed this with uh, the teachers and the teacher didn't get uh, why I didn't understand this idea. But in the end, yes, finally we could um, clear the situation and I got the idea behind uh, this uh, can syllable. So my resume is, next please. Um, there are a number of points with, which make it easy to learn Bahasa Indonesia, at least when it comes to everyday communication. But if you intend to have a good command of a language in whatever situation you have to occupy yourself with subjects like history of the language, general history of the country, in this case Indonesia, the relationship between societal groups and much more to acquire a, uh, to acquaint, uh, sorry, to acquire a sound knowledge of the language. To take the step from everyday communication level to a higher or even academic communication level requires a greater commitment and intensive training. With respect to this point, Bahasa Indonesia is not easier than other languages. On the next. Um, for this point, um, I would like to mention usually language classes at the university take place in the morning. That means guest lecturers might have their own teaching duties and can't, can't join language classes to improve or acquire language knowledge. But if we use digital or online classes, everyone can join whenever he or she has time to learn. Guest lecturers can connect with each other and learn the subject's special language, as well as everyday communication for academic purposes, which is quite different from everyday language on the road. And next, my short recapitulation and comparison. If I compare the learning situation I experience while learning Bahasa Indonesia with other learning situations, there are a few points I noticed which foster the learning of a language. Openness towards communication by the people of the country you are in. Early familiarity with the sound and communication habits, although you do not understand a word at all. Active exchange of information on topics about language. Comparison of languages and phenomena. Different learning methods are very important. Change between flat and steep progression. So you repeat, 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 and then you go forward a bit faster. And what is very important, observe communication of the people. But last but not least, you have to see language not only as a learning material, but as a medium of interacting with others. And the next. Learning conditions to acquire the language Bahasa Indonesia are very good and excellent. 
with respect to this, Bahasa Indonesia is a, learning, a language that is easy to learn. Terima kasih atas perhatian Anda. Okay. Uh, terima kasih banyak Ibu Otto uh, atas presentasinya yang sangat menarik. Ya, tadi kita bisa uh, ikut memahami ya dari sudut pandang Ibu Otto bagaimana beliau belajar bahasa Indonesia. Ternyata cukup panjang juga ada sejarahnya, ada kontak pertama dengan bahasa Indonesia. Kemudian ya beliau juga uh, mengatakan beberapa faktor yang uh, mempermudah atau menyulitkan dalam belajar bahasa Indonesia. Misalnya yang cukup sulit itu tadi uh, dengan ada ibu hankan di belakang, ini gunanya untuk apa ya? Oh ternyata itu cukup sulit. Nah di sini yang saya lihat menarik ya, yang bisa kita lihat ya, bagaimana uh, ilmu sastra Ibu Oto itu bisa mempengaruhi beliau juga dalam mempelajari ya. Beliau tuh melihat ke karakter manusia-manusia uh, Indonesia tuh bagaimana gitu ketika bertemu dengan orang asing yang orang asing yang sedang uh, seperti terlihat belajar bahasa Indonesia di situ dikatakan ya bagaimana masyarakatnya itu ingin tahu uh, senang untuk mengajak ngobrol dan ya itu banyak membantu belajar ya dan tidak masalah ketika membuat kesalahan uh, mereka juga membantu untuk memberikan uh, koreksinya oke okay. Nah, eh, kemudian ada hal-hal untuk pengucapan juga tidak terlalu sulit ya Ibu Oto ya, bagi mm. orang teman ya. Iya. Yeah. Nah, huruf R gitu ada di apa di dalam bahasa bahasa Eropa Barat ya tidak sulit untuk Ibu Oto misalnya. Um, R yeah. is not that difficult for me. Yeah. Uh, tidak sulit uh, karena uh, juga ada di uh, dalam um, uh, Jerman Selatan. Um, dan dahulu saya sedikit um, belajar bahasa Spanyol dan hmm. Spanyol mereka uh, juga uh, punya R, so hmm. this uh, R is not so difficult for me. Oke, okay. ya yeah. uh, terima kasih mm -hmm. banyak uh, Ibu Otto uh, atas penjabarannya yeah. yang dengan perspektif dari sastra ya seperti cerita tadi bagaimana pengalaman Ibu Otto belajar bahasa Indonesia melihat bahasa Indonesia dan menarik sekali dilihat di sini bahwa ternyata dalam belajar bahasa itu tidak hanya bahasanya tapi manusia-manusianya ya penutur jati bahasa itu juga turut membantu dalam belajar bahasa Indonesia ya kalau saya refleksikan kalau ke Jerman itu tidak seperti itu juga ya sulit untuk mencari orang di jalanan yang bisa kita ajak bercakap-cakap mm, ya. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dan kalau kita buat salah, eh, belum tentu loh dibantuin. <laughs> di Jerman itu cukup menarik memang. Ada yang ramah sekali, tapi yang tidak peduli juga banyak. <laughs> ya, yeah. eh, terima kasih Ibu Otto. Eh, sekarang eh, kita menuju ke presentasi kedua dulu bersama Bapak Svan Langgut. Gimana Bapak Svan Langgut sudah bisa hadir di sini kan? Ada bisa berbicara Bapak Svan Langgut? Halo, saya tidak ah, bisa ya. diper diperkenalkan dulu atau tidak? Ya, tentu saja saya akan memperkenalkan Bapak Svan Langgut. Iya, uh, Pak Svan Langgut ini dulu juga pernah uh, mengajar di FIB UI. Uh, pengalaman beliau banyak sekali. Ya, Bapak Svan Langgut, nama lengkapnya Edmond Svan Mari Langgut. Uh, beliau dilahirkan di Tolongs di Perancis tahun 66. Ya, kemudian eh, beliau sempat kuliah dan mendalami eh, ilmu ini ya, study of language and cultures of Austronesia di University of Hamburg. Kemudian beliau melanjutkan eh, studi masternya di bidang filologi Indonesia di Universitas Köln dengan tesis berjudul eh, Meom Palo. Eh, Buginis Neratif, di bawah bimbingan Profesor Dr. Pink. Kemudian dia juga uh, mendapatkan uh, pendidikan untuk bisa mengajarkan bahasa Jerman sebagai bahasa asing di Heinrich Heine University di kota Düsseldorf. Uh, setelah itu uh, beliau melanjutkan, oh beliau bekerja sebagai DAAD lektor di Universitas Pajajaran ya mungkin kalau ada teman-teman dari Unpad hadir di sini 
dari tahun 2002 sampai 2007 beliau adalah lektor uh, di Universitas Pajajaran di Bandung ya mengajarkan uh, sastra Jerman, linguistik dan bahasa Jerman sebagai bahasa asing. Kemudian uh, beliau kembali ke Jerman dan uh, melanjutkan uh, program doktoral beliau di bidang filologi of Indonesia di Universitas di Köln. Uh, disertasi beliau berjudul uh, Not a Word Without Meaning. Tunda as Name and Concept During Three Discourses of Power di bawah bimbingan Profesor Dr. Edwin P. Wiringa. Ya. Nama ini pembimbingnya juga tentu tidak asing bagi teman-teman di FIGUI atau Prodi Jawa yang banyak kerjasama dengan beliau. Ya, uh, setelah itu, setelah lulus uh, S3-nya, Bapak Swan Langgut ini melanjutkan karirnya ke Indonesia sebagai uh, Deputy Director at the DAED Regional Office di Jakarta dan menjadi lektor di Universitas Indonesia di program studi Jerman mengajarkan linguistik bahasa Jerman dan bahasa Jerman sebagai bahasa asing. Tahun 2016 telah uh, selesai karir beliau di program studi Jerman DAD, beliau melanjutkan ke kedutaan Jerman di Jakarta. Beliau menduduki jabatan sebagai uh, Head of Division Science and Technology at the German Embassy in Jakarta. Ya, kemudian beliau kembali ke Jerman dan saat ini beliau seorang Project Manager Get In Cicero di RVTH Aachen. Ya, kota Aachen sendiri tentu buat orang Indonesia bukan kota yang asing ya. Berkat... Uh, Presiden Habibie, BJ Habibie dulu sangat dikenal ya beliau sempat uh, kuliah di kota Aachen. Ya, beli, uh, Bapak Swanagut ini juga banyak sekali penelitiannya tapi untuk menyingkat waktu kita langsung saja ke Bapak Swan Langgut. Bagaimana? Herr Langgut? Ya. Guten Morgen untuk orang Jerman. <laughs> Morgen Gabriele. Selamat sore. Buat uh, teman-teman, rekan-rekan di Indonesia, kalau saya tidak salah kita bilang saya pakai bahasa Indonesia atau gimana? Boleh, pakai bahasa nah. Indonesia atau melanjutkan dalam bahasa Inggris juga tidak apa-apa. Terserah, I, I don't know, it's, both it's difficult for me actually. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Because we're speaking, we're speaking about the topic, um, I don't know all the, the words in uh, about grammar and... Yeah. language acquisition i don't know in uh, english as well as i don't know in indonesian so well um so just tell me okay Should we, I will, pa- we will continue in english yeah so in, everyone can understand I good think. in english so thank yeah. you very much uh, should i share again. the slides or? Mm-hmm. yes please please do it okay Moment. Thank you very much again for, not again, as uh, Gabriele, uh, Dr. Otto just said, for um, inviting me for this webinar. It's a great honor for me to be again in the, in the, in the circle of the, of the UE. Maybe make a full screen. In. Can you make it full screen, Adi? Yes. Yeah, ah, yeah. okay. It takes time. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we talked a lot about uh, what kind of topic could we, could I prepare for you? Uh, and you asked, same with Dr. Otto, of course, we allowed to that um, we should share about our personal um, experience learning a foreign language, especially Bahasa Indonesia. And um, of course, maybe also mixing it by what makes it so difficult, probably so difficult, to learn uh, German, what I have done. Uh, for me, it was a little bit a challenge because I don't have a final opinion about the thing. Is it difficult or is it not difficult? The whole topic is very difficult, <laughs> <laughs> not only the language. Um, but I want actually focus mainly on the point that there is a prasanka, what does it mean, a, a, a stereotype about Indonesian language, that what uh, Gabriel Otto also said, that everyone says, oh, Indonesian language, it's an artificial language. Some people say it's a very easy language. And 
on the other side, there's also the uh, uh, um, uh, assumption, there's also a prasanka, what is a stereotype about the German language um, from Indonesian side, they also say, it's not difficult because you speak as you read it, which is for me a quite interesting aspect. And this is actually an aspect I want to focus on a little bit about phonetics, about how to pronounce and also uh, the connection between a grapheme and a phoneme, so uh, how you write a sound, a, a language sound, and uh, what is behind the written uh, sign, which uh, sound, or which phoneme is actually hidden behind it, and make a little bit of comparison. But this is not really a scientific presentation, it's more mixing up experience and mixing up um, um, uh, anecdotes also of my personal experience uh, when I learned Indonesian language and when I was teaching uh, German language in Indonesia. So maybe make the next slide, please. Can you change the slide? <clears throat> Yeah, the next slide is the, the content. <clears throat> I, I uh, want to just give you a short impression about what is my, not what is my job now, but for whom I'm working. Um, this can be uh, not interesting for you because it's now I'm working for a nature science faculty, especially geo hydrogeology. Um, but there's also an aspect which is interesting for all scientists, for all academia, for all people who are working at universities to go on to have international cooperation, which in the end is also depending very much on communication. You have to think about how to communicate with your partner, uh, not only because of uh, you using maybe English, which is probably if you have a German Indonesian co cooperation, not the mother tongue for both of them, so you have a third language mixing and can include uh, mistakes and misunderstandings, but you also have to communicate in, uh, uh, like now, a time difference, which makes the communication sometimes difficult. And you communicate now with email, which contains its own uh, difficulties, or WhatsApp, which there can be a lot of uh, misunderstanding popping up, uh, even though there are a lot of uh, these uh, funny faces and uh, thumbs up or thumbs down, which can help sometimes to understand the meaning of a sentence. Um, but that will be only very short. Then, actually, I want to come to the topic, simple communication or what makes a language difficult. First, uh, focusing on the German language, some difficulties from German language, then challenges of the Indonesian language, and then uh, there's an idea I have how to have maybe some fun in learning a foreign language and actually a help um, which makes um, pronouncing a language some fun some uh, some fun because you're using another mm -hmm. accent on your own language or your own language accent on the on the other language so just to ex uh, enlarge your uh, understanding of language okay now what is get in cicero get in cicero next slide yeah get in cicero is a um, cooperation between uh, RWTH, Aachen, especially the Faculty 5 for um, Hydrogeology, with uh, UGM, the Faculty for Engineering. It's, um, I just want to say, uh, focus on it's uh, supported by the Federal Ministry of Education Research. And in the moment, it is actually the largest active measure in Indonesia, supported by the BMBF, the Ministry of Education Research, um, for cooperation. Please, the next one. It's called um, a, a, a campus, a research campus, but it's actually not for students. It's for research projects. And uh, the core of this project is a laboratory, which is installed with the German money at the UGM, as you see in the picture. Uh, and the, uh, the opening was a visit from the Indonesian delegation in the RWTH. And the second one is uh, um, His Excellency Botschafter uh, Schof visiting the uh, UGM laboratory. And down there was an opening ceremony to the laboratory, uh, a picture of it. And uh, this is the core. It's funded with nearly 800,000 for instruments. And next slide, please. 
and um, it, it is to be used for re joint research projects in four clusters, clusters from these uh, faculty of earth science here in, in RWTH, it's environment and water, sustainable geo resources, geo hazards, coastal risk, energy and raw materials. Okay, just the next slide gives you an idea about the structure. Um, and this is already the last slide on uh, Get in Cicero. I just want to um, give you a little bit input and spirit. Go on, have international corporations. There's a lot of funding from Indonesian side, from German side, even though it's in the moment a little bit difficult to travel, as you can imagine, because of Corona. Okay, coming now to the topic. Simple communication or what makes a language difficult. Please go on to the next one. First, uh, I had already said that Indonesian have a stereotype about the German language that they say um, it's pronounced as it is written. So it's very easy to learn it because you just read what it's written and you know, you know how to speak German. But actually, if you know, of course, there's grammar, there's different stuff. But in the first thing you have to realize is even though it is very close together in how to pronounce, there is, of course, big differences between what is written and how to pronounce it. And you see, first, we have the relationship between, between a phoneme and a grapheme. And normally, if you uh, open up a dictionary or a language learning book or a phonetic book about languages, you find uh, tables like this where you see the phoneme on the left side. I don't know, can I give you some, uh, no, I don't know. Uh, where you find uh, on the left side the phonemes, it's written with this, um, uh, with this Garis Miering. And then we have, it's a German table, excuse me, we have uh, how it's written in German. And please leave it on the first, Ari. Can you go back one? Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, for ex an example in English, for example, how it's written maybe in English. So you see, we have the phoneme A. Ah. In German, it's written A, ah, like the phonetic alphabet, the EPR, you maybe know. In English, it can be written with a U. And then, of course, you have examples like um, in which words this phoneme, this sound, a phoneme is only a sound, is included. And you see that we have the same phoneme, but different written in English and German. In Indonesian and German, we don't have it. But this is the first uh, uh, very important point. Between Indonesian language and German language, we have a huge difference because we have different phonemes for long and short vowels. And this is something, uh, some, uh, or at least in the beginning, Indonesian lear learners of the German language struggles with, because a phoneme is a sound which difference, differentiated the meaning. So, the same word with two different sounds have maybe two different meanings, the same writing. So, you have, for example, the word beten and betten. One is pronounced with a long A, one is pronounced with a short A. And the long and the short A makes a difference in the meaning. Beten means to pray. Beten means tempatidor, tempatidor. Uh, so more than one tempatidor. <laughs> uh, a few beds. So, uh, and you see it here, the same phoneme on the, left, uh, on the left row. There's an A and there's an A with a double point behind. This is a long A and a short A. And in Indonesian language, you don't differentiate that. Actually, you can speak Indonesian with long or short vowels, and maybe an Indonesian native speaker would think, this sounds a little bit strange, but it still doesn't change the meaning. You say, can say, kita makan, and you can say, kita makan. It's the same. In German, it could be different, actually. It could be, have a different meaning. Beten, beten. Uh, uh, I have different uh, examples later on. And so you see that we have the most vowels. We come, now you can go to the next one. It's just uh, another example. Go on, go on, please, until we have the, the vowel di diagram. One more. Yeah. Uh, here you see the German vowels diagram, it's called. And um, besides the long and short, 
uh, vowels, which is different. We also have uh, uh, umlaut, which is rounded lips, which is, uh, this is also a really a difficult thing for Indonesian to learn. Um, so we have u and we have u. You didn't see it from the front, but uh, if you see it from the side, if you have the umlaut, the lips are a little bit more rounded and a little bit more to the front than with a normal pronunciation. And we have a a and we have o ö. This is really something funny because um, this sound is not ö. Uh, you have some some languages in the Indonesian area have a kind of ö, but a ü they, they don't have. And this is something Indonesian learners really struggle with. And here we have uh, different um, uh, examples again, beten and beten. We have, you see down there, the, the last line, we have bitten and beaten. Bitten means to uh, ask for something and beaten means to, uh, to, 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 uh, I'd say to tawar, to uh, tawar menawar. <clears throat> we have mannen and manen. Uh, which means manen is a, a man, a plural of man, and manen means, um, uh, oh, in English, I don't know. But this is, you see, um, and now I want to show you something else again down here. Um, we have, just have a look at the last line, betten and beten. You see that the short E is followed by a double T which doesn't mean that the T is different pronounced, it just is a sign for the reader that the E is short. This could be nice, you see the same is beaten, a uh, bitten. You have B-I-T-T-E-N. That means the double T is a sign, a graphic sign, that not that the T is different pronounced, but that the E is short. This is something also people underestimate because this is an interesting aspect in Indonesian languages, not in all. Um, in other languages, a double consonant can mean that you have a geminata. That means that the, that the consonant is also at the end of the first syllable and in the beginning of the second syllable pronounced. So it's enlonged, kind of. In German, it's not. We have betten und beten. Bitten und bieten, mannen und mahnen. And now in the end, mahnen, you see that there is also another sign, another grapheme um, to show, just to indicate that the A is a long A, which means if behind the vowel is an H, that can mean the vowel has to be pronounced long. So we have, and another one, another example is in the beaten thing, behind the I is an E. EI, nee, IE, sorry, means this is a long I, E in German. So we have e, EE means E, a long E. Um, but here you see this is a difficulty what um, people have to learn, and it's clearly not that simple that you just read what you see or that you just pronounce what is written, because a long vowel can be written in three different ways. One with an H, one with an EA, or just one without anything. You just have to know that it's a long E. So German is not that logical, but no language is logical. Okay, let's go on for the next slide. Yeah, we also have uh, the, the nice thing, not only umlaute and long and short vowels and uh, 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 different types of vowels, um, but we also have diphthongs, which is, for example, here it's I, au, and oi. And you see, the, writ the writing actually is not correct. We're writing e i and a a i. It's the same diphthong. It's the same. It's the same uh, 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 phoneme actually, which means I. Actually, you 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 you, uh, you speak like an A-I. Then we have au, and the funniest thing actually is the, the oi, because it starts with a writing with an E and a U, but actually it's pronounced like an O going to an E, oi. So some, nothing to do with the, with the graphemes you see, with the letters you see. Okay, but this is not really a challenge for Indonesian, 
speakers because um, you also have these kind of diphthongs. But we come later that it's a challenge for the German speakers because the diphthongs or the graphemic representation of diphthongs in Indonesian is really a challenge for German speakers. Let's go on for the next slide. This is one of my favorite, if you can say so, for uh, phonetics of German. This is called the consonant clusters because it's very, very, uh, how to say, famous actually that as a German you have to be, or as a German speaker, you have to be able to pronounce a lot of consonants without any vowel. Indonesian language is more or less consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel. You have a, a, a you have a normally, uh, every consonant is followed by a vowel, more or less. You have some special, but we see it later again. The Germans don't have it. And um, it was one of my, my, my favorite chapters in the, the German language grammar book was uh, the consonant clusters of syllables. So one syllable word with how many consonants and how many uh, vocals you can have. And uh, actually you see here that we have in the German, uh, German language three just go down there on the, on the, on the line. Uh, we have um, uh, words with just one vowel. It's, uh, uh, we have words with a consonant vowel, C, vowel. We have words with a vo vowel and consonants. And then uh, always single syllables, no? only one syllable. And you see that it goes down until you have three consonants, one vowel, and again three consonants, or two consonants, one vowel, and four consonants even. This is uh, quite a challenge because the pronunciation has to be exact. So if you don't do that, Germans are not really, uh, how to say, uh, tolerant, like uh, Gabriela just so said, fall tolerant to this aspect if you missing one or two of these consonants. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Here we have, actually, it's a, I, I missed it because it's the same slide as, a, as the one. I think it's the one with, uh, with five consonants. And you see some nice uh, examples which you have to learn if you want to learn German. Uh, for example, consonant clusters with P. We have uh, consonant clusters with P, F, S, T, like in hupfst. And you have to say hupfst. You cannot say hupft because hupft is different form of hupfst. Oops, is the second person, you jumping, <laughs> no, you jumped, so it's a past tense. And uh, if you say hupft, that means he jumped past tense. So you have to pronounce actually hupft. You see all the PFST uh, or like MPFT, like gekampft, it's written, I think it's uh, gekampft, um, lumpst, plunged. I think it's um, if you want to disencourage people learning German, you just have to give them a row of these words and nobody want to start learning German, <laughs> but uh, changing to another language. Herbst is also a really nice word. Please, let's go to the next one. It becomes even, next slide, please. It becomes even better because in German, it's also very famous, the, the the long, that you can combine a lot of nomen, uh, becoming a long, 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 long word. And uh, I don't want to talk about that. The longest word you can pronounce in German. There's really funny examples, but it will not be very uh, visible. But you see, the possibility to combine two nomen together, two, two words, two main, uh, I don't know in English, um, katabenda, uh, gives you the chance that you even can combine eight consonants in a row. Like you see here in the first example, we have two words. The first word is angst, which means fear, takut, ketakutan, and schweiß, which means kringat. And you can make kringat takut, which is in German becomes one word, which is angstschweiß. You see we have uh, two vowels and a lot of consonants which you all have to pronounce. If not, you will not uh, get your high level German certification. Or Deutsch Schweizer, Geschichtsschreibung, Geschichtsschleier, especially the S in the middle, the, I, there's a Fugen S, I think it's called in, in German, I don't know in English, is something which is a foreign 
uh, foreign language learners uh, try to avoid. I, I remember from my experience teaching German. Um, Unterrichtsschritt. Okay, there, or there is Angst schlotternd. Herbst schwimmfest. <laughs> Nicht schnellere. You see, uh, I laugh by myself because if I hear these sounds, I know that it sounds quite absurd for people who want to learn this language. It's difficult, it's a challenge. And also a lot of German people struggle to pronounce them, maybe without, in the times today you have to use a mask actually to pronounce them because uh, I'll say Hujan Lokal. So let's go to the next one. Another um, struggle is of course, also a consonant thing is uh, the X in, as a phoneme, um, that you have ich und ach. And uh, this is a phonetic uh, phenomena. It's called allophone because it's the same uh, phoneme but has different realizations depending on the, on the sound uh, sur surroundings. So if you have more vowels which are pronounced in the front, like E, you have, it's more like ich. And if you have uh, vowels like an A, in, in the back, you have an ach, ich. The funny thing is, or oh, maybe it's not funny, I don't know, the, uh, but an aspect is that um, people in the Swiss, Swiss German, they have only one realization, which is the one in the back, which makes for Germans, German German speakers, I have to say, uh, it's sometimes funny to listen to Swiss people. They say, ich, for us, it sounds not correct, but actually in, the Swiss, in, in, in Swiss German, you only have one realization of these allophone. Of course, learning German is not only about phonetics, but um, I don't want to extend my, um, my, my, house, my examples of fear to uh, the f f f inflection I've learned. It's in English, so flexion uh, to gender to grammatical cases and time and go on and go on. There's a lot of challenges to pronounce it right. Let's go to the next one. Oh yeah, I put this in um, just to, uh, to make clear again, not to make clear, it's, I, I think it's a very nice example. I like this picture, it's from Saussure, uh, from his, um, uh, from his uh, linguistic excourse. And it should show the connection between, it shows the connection between what we uh, pronouncing, the sounds and actually the imagination, but you also can make it like the sounds and the grapheme, how you represent it uh, visual, it's uh, nearly the same. And you see that the thing is, it should be segmented. That's uh, the dotted lines from A to B. Uh, and this is the most important. And these segments are uh, arbitrary. There is no logic in it. And you cannot ask why is um, uh, an A in English written U and in German written A. It makes, this question makes no sense. The thing is that this is a standard and you have to know how to pronounce it and there are certain rules. And uh, the arbitrary, T, arbitrarity, is um, also important because language is not a logical system. And we come back to this later. German tends to be quite logical. This makes it very difficult. The German language tends to define everything um, to the point so that you normally, normally, you have also misunderstanding, but normally if you pronounce a sentence or if you write a sentence anyway, correctly, then there is not much variation in meaning in German language. We come back to that uh, in Indonesia later, if it's the same or not. But you see, you have to learn a lot in Germany to pronounce something correctly. And if you pronounce it correctly, it expresses what you are thinking. And maybe in Indonesian, it's a little bit different. Please, next slide. Challenges of the Indonesian language. Next slide. Done, because it's so simple. Everyone can learn it in two days. <laughs> I think Gabriel Otto also uh, made clear that she needed longer time and there are challenges, of course. Next slide. Really none. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. Please go on the next slide. Yeah. We have the so-called, it's so simple. It has no grammar, everyone says. But that's not true. The grammar is just different. As I said, 
um, for example, there is no gender. But that doesn't mean that Indonesian, if they speak, not including gender. I'm quite sure that if people using the word dia, which means he or she, or in German even it, uh, if there is a story, they are quite fast, quite, quite fast coming to the conclusion if, if someone is talking about a woman or a girl, a woman or a man, sorry, a girl or a boy. Um, for me, it drives me normally crazy if an Indonesian tells a story and he's starting with dia pergi. I always directly ask, he or she, is it a boy or a girl? Maybe, actually, it's not important. Maybe it's an example that we have a more, uh, how to say, uh, how to say, it's diverse language because is it so important if it's a man eating or a woman eating? For us, as a German, we have this grammatical structure that we have to define. Is it a he, a she, or it? And then we start imagining the story, but in a lot of contexts, it doesn't make any, it, it, it's not necessary, actually. But, of course, you see, it, it can be a problem. So you have no inflection. It's not true. We have some examples given by Gabriel Otto for, before. Plural singular is not as an inflection in press, but, of course, Indonesian language has a way to express if there is more than one uh, people. And then again, the, the thing that um, people say, oh, it's, it's, it's very easy because you pronounce it as it's written. Uh, just to give you an uh, example, again, from phonetics. It's one of my um, most favorite examples because I was really stunned. I had a student who was saying that she had a, um, say she, she had a, a, a ball, a ball pen, it's written, a letter friend, and she said, his name is Uwe. And I said, who? Uwe. What? No, there's no German called <laughs> with the name Uwe. And actually it was the German name Uwe. And you see that we have a, a different realization of the, of the, um, of the phoneme phi, which is a, in German, it's realized with a labio dental, which means your lower lip goes on the teeth. V, v, you have to do it. In Indonesian, you pronounce this V with B labial, so W, and more, more, more softer in W. It's Java. In German, it's Java, the island Java. And um, in English, it's also the island Java, but uh, in Indonesian, it's for sure Java. Okay. And then I said again, um, we have these um, long and short vowels, but in Indonesian you have stressed and unstressed vowels. So not the length is important, but the stress. And this is very difficult for Germans, uh, Indonesian speaking German, and German want to learn Indonesian because for example, normally they don't say te, they say te. I want to drink tea. Saya mau minum tea. And if you say that in a warung, nobody want, will give you tea because they say, what? We don't have tea. Then you have to say, oh, te. Oh, te. Okay. <laughs> you see, this is, 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 especially if you see the writing, it's very um, misleading for a German. If you see the writing of te, it's T-E-H. So he thinks maybe it's a, a long E, a T but not an open E, which is actually a little bit more like a, like a, like a umlauf, nearly, te, you could say. Okay, then we have these things. We talked about consonant clusters, and um, there is this um, um, phoneme in Indonesian, which is an NG, written NG with uh, the Garis Miring, a backslash or what it is. And this is also a challenge for the German because in Indonesian language, this is one phoneme, one sound, which is on the end of the syllable. And the next syllable begins with a, begins with a vowel normally or with, an, with another consonant. So the German word finger, your finger, uh, the German would say finger, ein finger. The G would little bit connect or start the next syllable. The Indonesian would pronounce fing er, ein fing er, because the ng is as one for name come together, together. A real challenge for German learning Indonesian is also the word 
the combination N G Nyan Yi. This is something I always struggle also if I have to say it fast or a lot of times. Also, you see again uh, the, the word like Belakangan. The German tend to say Belakangan. So they make it G A N at the end. But actually, the last syllable is the an, not a gun. But we would separate between the n and the g. Then we have, of course, difficulties as a German speaker because it's not that logic. Even if Indonesians say, oh, plural, very simple, you just double the word. So you have a word like gula, which means sugar, but gula gula doesn't mean a lot of sugar, it means it's a sweet. We have the word kupu kupu, which actually, I don't know if there also only one kupu. What is one kupu? No, a kupu kupu is a, a I'd say, a, a butterfly. And I, I'm not sure how to pronounce many butterflies. Is many butterflies kupu 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 kupu? Or not? <laughs> I'm not sure. We have the, what Gabriela also started again. She also introduced some, uh, some language uh, class, uh, um, uh, aspects to us with the ke an form. So we have the word hujan, but ke hujanan doesn't mean, uh, uh, I don't know in English actually, rain as a, as a more complex thing, but means you get wet because of rain. Ke manisan means not that this it's, it's, uh, the sugary thing or something, but means it's too sweet. My tea is too sweet. Teh Kemanisan or something, as a question. Okay, next slide, please. And then, of course, what I said in the beginning, um, there is no real uh, one, ein Eindeutigkeit. Language is not in itself logic structured because it should be open to development. And if a language is on the, only in one meaning, one, one, uh, one, one way to, to build something up, then there is no development. And language, and this is a fantastic thing about language, develops. You can make up new meaning. You can build up new words by combining old one. If you only have a one-one connection, you could not do that. In Indonesian, it's really, I think, on the other side of the scale from the German. As I said before, as a German, if you build up a correct, grammatically correct sentence, the variation in meaning is very small. You normally only have one meaning. In Indonesian, it's not. You can make up nearly every sentence is correct, like you see here. Apa itu jiva, jiva itu apa, itu apa jiva, jiva apa itu, apa jiva itu, itu jiva apa. So it's, it's, a, it's a permutation of three words, and every sentence is correct, if I'm correct. I think every sentence is correct but I'm not sure what every sentence means. <laughs> so you can talk to someone, maybe in Indonesian, and you think you already know Indonesian, and you, see, you know you're talking correctly, but in the end, you don't know what you're saying. This is really interesting as aspect on Indonesian language for me still, because a lot you have to know how to express something. You have to know how to say something, and you cannot really um, uh, concluded from grammar or grammatical rules. Who is saya makan? Of course, some things are just uh, like absurd. Who is saya makan? Saya kue makan, kue makan saya. Of course, uh, the last sentence at least is uh, not possible because a cake cannot eat me, but I have, uh, I eat a cake. But even the last sentence is grammatically <coughs> correct, but this kind of thing you can also do in German language. Okay, next. Entschuldigung, Herr Langut, also Sie haben ja. noch drei, drei Minuten, okay? Ist das genug, ja? Drei ja, es Minuten. reicht. Ja, okay. <lacht> ich weiß das okay. schon. <lacht> okay, next sentence, okay. Uh, next slide. Ja, habe ich schon gedruckt. Uh, also es dauert immer, yeah. okay. Dankeschön. Bitte schön. Um, you see, even, even the, what we had the connection between Grafheim and Vornehm is, um, is a man-made connection. We have, um, how to say, we have uh, 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 I forgot the name, to change the rules of how to write something. In German, we also have it. The long, um, there's a double S for a sharp S and there's a how, to, how to write something. Uh, the, the grapheme, the graphemic representation of language 
changes. And in Indonesia, it's very, very famous that you have these Eja and Lama, uh, which is a, a change to a new writing. Okay, next one. Okay, I think uh, due to a short time, you, you, I, just, I just wanted to show you that the NG in uh, Indonesian language is actually one, one phoneme. Okay, we go to the next one. Ah, yeah, and you see um, something is written. I didn't found any uh, examples actually, but just see the last. Um, uh, there is some uh, vowel, uh, uh, phonemes, sounds which are difficult for Germans to pronounce or non-native speaker of Indonesian. And just see the last rule. That's really interesting. You have these um, these uh, diphthong like I and Au, which are pronounced I and Au in final position, like Kau, Beliau. Uh, um, sorry, I, 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 I forget now. That's a really a, a not nice word. I remember, uh, but they are pronounced as separate vowels if they are found on another place. This is, for example, not you see, it's a not logical thing. But in German, you had always a u is always au. Not always. We also have some. <laughs> okay, ne next one. So this was just to compare the vowel system, and you see we have much more vowels to learn. But mainly due to umlaut and due to uh, to um, long and short versions. Okay, next one. Yeah, I think just go to the next one. Because uh, I just want to give you a last. I didn't bring the example now with a foreign accent. Next one. Yeah, this one. I just want to finish my presentation now with uh, uh, something I learned about Indonesian language very lately. After so many years of speaking and learning Indonesian language, um, there's also, I think, the impact of having a wrong perception of other people. And I just want to talk openly. Sometimes I think the accent of Americans speaking Bahasa Indonesia is very hard because Americans have a problem sometimes to imagine other language because they are living in an English or British also English speaking world or Australians. Now they don't need to learn other languages because they, they everywhere they go, no, nearly everywhere or a lot of countries they can speak English. So, and I was it, uh, in Sumatra and there was an American who said, um, Saya mau lihat orangutan. And I said, oh, <laughs> what a hard accent, orangutan. No, no, not yet, please. Last, oh. I know I finished, but last, <laughs> <I> finished, sorry. <laughs> um, and I thought what, how, how, how that he has only a little bit, not, not really a feeling for language to speak it orangutan. But then, uh, he was actually using an English sentence. I want to see, I want to see orangutans. I said, can you not say, I want to see orangutans? Because this is how they're called, also in German, orangutan. And then I had a look, and you see it here, in, uh, in a dictionary. And this is interesting because orangutan is already an English word, becomes an English word, is incorporated in the English language, but with the pronunciation orangutan. So he correctly pronounced it, even though there is an Indonesian version of the, of the word, which means orangutan, and it's said or, orangutan. So this is what I want to say at the end. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Okay, uh, terima kasih banyak, uh, Bapak Langut, atas uh, penjelasannya dengan banyak contoh-contoh yang luar biasa. Uh, mungkin bagi anak-anak yang belajar bahasa juga cukup sulit ya. <laughs> ya, untuk memahami yeah. sisi fonetik ini sedetail itu ya terlebih lagi juga eh, sekarang eh, penggunaan lab bahasa mulai ditinggalkan untuk pronunciation tapi tentu banyak penggantinya oke okay, eh, untuk mempersingkat waktu eh, eh, kami juga sudah mendapatkan eh, banyak pertanyaan dari teman-teman yang hadir sekalian dan kami berterima kasih untuk itu eh, kami mengundang Bapak Langgut dan Ibu Oto juga untuk bersama-sama eh, berdiskusi untuk mencoba menjawab beberapa pertanyaan yang masuk ya uh, mungkin kita mulai dengan pertanyaan yang termudah uh, bagaimana cara Bapak Ot, uh, Bapak Langgut dan Ibu Oto uh, cara yang paling mudah untuk mempelajari bahasa Indonesia bagaimana Can you repeat this in German? Ya yeah, we 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 learn am leichtesten Indonesisch 
Ja, Sie können das auf Deutsch antworten und ich werde das übersetzen ins Indonesische. Okay. Wer zuerst? Du. Okay. Ja. Um. <lacht> Oder? <lacht> um. Äh, Achso. Soll ich, ich spreche jetzt Deutsch oder Indonesisch? Indonesisch. Indonesisch. Deutsch. Also, learning Indonesian, learning a foreign language, this is what I want to say. Learning a foreign language is always a challenge. And like the learning process at all, everybody has to find his own way. There are people, I, I, I know some, a colleague, a a what is a Komilitone. For me, in, when, I, when I learned Indonesian language in Hamburg, I learned three years and I could not really say one sentence. And there was a, a, a friend, she learned two years and she spoke perfect. She really spoke perfectly Bahasa Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Then I learned three sentences and I went to Indonesia for one year. And when I arrived at Jakarta, I was shocked because nobody spoke as they taught us in, in university. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that the woman, the friend of mine who spoke perfect Bahasa Indonesia, Baku, I think it is, she could read Kompas, but she cannot spoke to someone at Pasar Senen. Mm. Because this is one, one aspect of Indonesian which is really, really uh, important. The the correct, the high class Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, Baku, is so different from what is taught, uh, what is how people speak. So we have the street Indonesian, I would say, or Umgangs, the Umgangssprache, what you use uh, daily, the Hari Hari. And in Germany we also have it, but it's not that huge difference. It mm. is, we have dialect, we have, but let's just talk about the Hari Hari. But in Indonesian, it's a huge difference. And most, I think one of the, the, the important, most important reasons is because Indonesian language is still pro promoted. I think I, I have no numbers, but I think most Indonesians have a local language, speak a local language at home. Now the young generation, there's a lot who speak Bahasa Indonesia at home, but still in the, in the, in the areas, a lot of people speaking Uh, Javanese, Sundanese, Makassaris, Buginese, uh, Batak, and, and so on, uh, Achenese. So they're speaking local language and Bahasa Indonesia is the first language they learn in school and they have to learn it. So the way they speak it, very simple. And if they communicate, they communicate simple and regional. And this is what uh, Gabriel Otto just said, makes it also very nice to learn Bahasa Indonesia because people are very easy to communicate with. They like to speak and they also accepting a lot of faults, mispronunciation because they are used to. If you from Jakarta meet someone from Lombok, you, you listen to the sound, you know maybe he comes from Eastern, East Indonesia and you, you're accepting that he is saying E, Belok, not Belok, something. So you're, what um, Gabriel Otto said, uh, fault tolerance is very high. This is really what makes it so nice. You can speak with a lot of mistakes and even though you speak not correctly, people try to understand and really understand you. This is different if you speak or learn French. If you just pronounce it a little bit wrong, people from France will not understand you. Ya, yeah, uh, untuk Ibu Otto, bagaimana berdasarkan pengalaman belajar bahasa asingnya, bagaimana Uh, di sini juga ada pertanyaan untuk Ibu Oto ya, bagaimana melancarkan pelafalan bahasa asingnya dan cara apa yang termudah bagi Ibu Oto untuk mempelajari bahasa Indonesia? Auf Deutsch. Iya. Yeah. Uh, ich frage auf Deutsch. Oh, Oke, okay. alles klar. Ja, yeah. also, we, we haben sie in Indonesia am leichtesten gelernt. Wir ja, haben sie Tipps oder nach ihrer Erfahrung, wir haben sie das gemacht. Und wie ist es mit der Aussprache? Ja, wie haben Sie Ihre Aussprache geübt? Also die verschiedenen Sachen hängen total zusammen. Die Aussprache hängt auch sehr stark davon ab, was wir hören, logischerweise, weil wir über das Hören eine Sprache aufnehmen. Und bei mir war das halt dieser Sonderfall, dass ich wirklich in einem sehr frühen Alter 
ähm, Martha Indonesia in Deutschland schon gehört habe. Und zwar über viele Jahre, von 1972 bis ungefähr 1976 sehr intensiv. Äh, und dann war diese Studentengruppe, mit denen wir befreundet waren, haben dann verschiedene berufliche Wege auch gehabt. Aber dann in den 80er Jahren hatte ich wieder sehr engen Kontakt zu einer, ja inzwischen Familie von diesen Studenten. Ähm, und die haben natürlich mit mir weiter Deutsch gesprochen, aber untereinander habe ich Indonesisch gehört. Und das heißt, also wir wissen das auch aus dem Sprachunterricht, wenn man einen frühen Kontakt hat, gerade auch in Bezug auf die Aussprache und das Hören, dann kann man die Sprache besser lernen. Also okay. wir wissen, dass, dass wir, wenn wir alt sind, können wir äh, dieses sozusagen, ich weiß nicht, vielleicht sind, ist unser Gehör schon so besetzt von so viel, was wir gehört haben, nehmen wir das Hören nicht so leicht auf. Das ist also, als Kind kann man leicht etwas hören und man kann das imitieren. Diese Fähigkeit ist, äh, wenn man im höheren Alter eine Sprache äh, lernt, sehr eingeschränkt. Und okay. ich glaube, dieses frühe Hören, das war sehr wichtig. Okay. Ja, yeah, also, uh, saya mencoba menerjemahkan apa yang Ibu Otto sudah jelaskan. Mm -hmm. ya. <laughs> Cukup panjang penjelasannya, tapi intinya uh, Ibu Otto uh, menjelaskan bahwa uh, kontaknya dengan bahasa Indonesia sudah dimulai uh, sejak uh, waktu beliau masih muda dulu, pernah kontak dengan bahasa Indonesia, dan menurut beliau uh, penting sekali kontak pertama mendengar bahasa dari uh, penutur jatinya sedini mungkin, ya itu juga bisa kita amati ya kalau dari anak kecil itu bisa lebih mudah untuk uh, menangkap, mendengarkan dan mengimitasi uh, bagaimana penutur jati membicarakan atau mengucapkan sebuah bahasa. Ya faktor ini tentunya sebuah faktor yang menurut beliau penting. Oke, okay. ya Frau Otto, haben Sie noch was zu sagen? We haben Sie Indonesia's am leichtesten gelernt? Eine Erfahrung hatte ich mal ziemlich am Anfang in Indonesien und das knüpft auch wieder an meine frühen Erfahrungen in Deutschland an. Und zwar, äh, was ich sagte, um, facial expression and gestures and body language. Um, so, uh, once I drove with a taxi to a theater Salihara, um, but I didn't know the way to the theater, only a little bit because I had a map and the taxi driver continued asking me, do we have to uh, go further Lurus, Lurus, or do, mm -hmm. do we have to turn to Kanan or Kiri? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure about the way. And I mm -hmm. only said, uh, yes, Munkin, Munkin. <laughs> and after three or four corners, mm -hmm. he uh, turned uh, to me and he said, oh, you speak quite good Bahasa Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And I think I only said Munkin, but, um, um, after a couple of years, I recognized um, you use very often this word munkin in Indonesian. Yeah. Um, and he recognized that uh, uh, perhaps I incidentally had the um, right um, reaction to his question. So when I say munkin, it means, yes, you can turn to the left, it could be right, or perhaps it's wrong, but yes, munkin, just try. So this is the way of living in Indonesia. Um, to express something, yes, it's a bit uncertain, maybe it's right or it's wrong, just try to go to the left or to the right, whatever you think it's the right way. And um, it was a couple of years later, I was waiting at the, the airport for a taxi. And um, uh, you know the situation at the airport with the taxi drivers, everyone is coming and offering a taxi to you. And I was waiting for a Bluebird taxi. And then the man from Bluebird, he came to me, Oh, it's, you are already living for a long time in Indonesia, but I, I didn't talk to him. I, he couldn't know that I was living long, for a long time there. Mm -hmm. But I think he has observed that my body language towards all these offers were perhaps I already adapted a little bit to Indonesia. So my body language was what Indonesians would have expressed by body language to all these offers. So I think this body language is really very important. And that is what I mentioned uh, very shortly in my presentation. Um, if you want to learn the language, you have to observe uh, your surrounding, your environment, how people communicate with, with each other. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I um, very often went to theater or concerts in uh, Jakarta. And I love to sit in the back of, uh, yes, in the back, so I could observe uh, how, how is the reaction of uh, the other peoples 
uh, watching uh, the stage, for example. So I learned how Indonesians react on situations. And so this is, yes, observing your environment, how they um, uh, deal together with each other. And yes, this make it, made it simple for me to adapt with the situation. Yeah. <laughs> Ya, pengalaman yang menarik ya dari Ibu Oto. Ya, eh, kita coba ke pertanyaan selanjutnya. Tadi sempat disinggung juga sama Bapak Langgut ya tentang bahasa informal dan formal dalam bahasa Indonesia. Ya, seberapa jauh hal itu bisa menyulitkan dalam pembelajaran bahasa Indonesia? So, ya, yeah, we, ya. Yeah. So, warum ist es schwierig, ist es wegen dieser uh, formella und informella Indonesia, ja, yeah, also eine Sprache zu lernen, wie kann man das im Unterricht unterscheiden oder, ja, yeah, welche Wirkung hat das eigentlich auf den Lernprozess? Ibu Otto oder Bapak Langgut? Ja. Ja, soll ich anfangen? Ja, bitte schön. Mm -hmm. Also, you cannot really make a difference. You just should give uh, also informal Indonesian. Let's say like this, um, depending who is teaching. I know that a lot of Indonesian teachers now in Germany using books which are, have a pragmatic approach to language. So it's not about learning Bahasa Indonesia Baku, learning the high class Indonesian, but learning how to survive or how to uh, learning how to communicate and they have these um, these uh, how to say these situations for example like shopping and then there is not the correct form but they're using for example the the indonesian daily uh, dialogues uh, when you buy something what can the seller probably ask you or how to communicate in a restaurant or so actually there is now they differentiate but i know of course if you learn Bahasa indonesia like me at the university uh, what should they do they cannot teach the wrong thing same like you 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 uh, i see my colleagues here teaching a german language you cannot teach your students the wrong use of dative even though most germans uh, don't <laughs> don't use the dative in the right form so that's a, that's the way but of course um make clear what is the purpose people want to learn the language for. Um, Indonesian, you have to learn both. You have to learn two languages mm -hmm. because if you want to read newspaper, you need the high class, the, the standard, the high standard Indonesian language. If you want to read uh, most literature, um, novels, you need a high class Indonesian. Not all because there's also mixing, of course, mixing uh, colloquial, forms and a Bahasa program on something. But of course, newspaper, for example, is actually the best thing. If you want to read Kompas, you need to learn Bahasa Baku. That's for me. Yeah, dan bagaimana menurut Ibu Otto? Ada, so, we, yes. is ira erfarung as a mit hoch indonesis oder informels indonesis with dialect and, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, at first I only learned uh, what uh, the people uh, spoke speak in the uh, on the streets of course um and um, with the academic level yes it was quite difficult uh, because yes my working language was german of course because i was teaching german at the university um so for to act for the active use of the part of academic language Bahasa Indonesia, there was no, not really a need for me. So I only adapted maybe to some body language or gestures or some uh, uh, form of politeness on, and so on. But um, for I learned something, of course, um, while reading the bachelor thesis from the students. Um, but I didn't use it for, for active, uh, I, I didn't have the active use of um, Bahasa Indonesia in academic, on the academic level. Um, and this I regret uh, really a little bit, but I, yes, I didn't have uh, enough time and um, the courses were in the morning, so I didn't have the chance to learn this. And, but I think that would be quite useful to learn academic language as well, or this um, Bahasa Indonesia Buku. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the. Ya, yeah. terima kasih untuk uh, jawabannya dari Ibu Oto. Uh, kita coba lagi ada pertanyaan selanjutnya. Uh, ya, yeah, Ibu Oto nih untuk Ibu Oto ya. Yeah. Asal bahasa Indonesia. Asia is easy to learn, but if we want to communicate properly, it's not easier than other languages. How do you describe communicate properly? Yeah, the first statement is yeah, communicate properly. Um, yes, for example, I think um, I already mentioned I didn't get that deep into Bahasa Indonesia. Mm -hmm. um, um, maybe it's a kind of um, the variety of, of words vocabulary um, for everyday language you have uh, not that much words than you uh, have to use for academic purposes um, and for grammar um, it's important and maybe if you talk to somebody i know there are differences you have you actually have to make uh, whether you're talking to somebody who is on a higher societal level than you are or the same level or if there is somebody who is not at the same level as you are so for us in germany we uh, could not really imagine uh, what that means but in indonesia i think it's very important so maybe if you learn only the everyday language from bahasa indonesia and you address maybe a a professor or somebody at the university, maybe it sounds a little bit impolite. Um, so you should learn all these things about, um, yes, academic, uh, everyday academic language. I think that would be very important because if you address somebody as if you would talk to some like Pembantu, maybe it's very impolite for Indonesian. So yes. That's the proper language I meant. If you mm -hmm. talk to a professor, you have to use a different language. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ya, yeah. on on so dari Bapak Langgut ada tanggapan untuk pertanyaan tadi apa itu uh, berkomunikasi secara uh, proper, secara tepat. Apa yang paling penting menurut Bapak Langgut? Uh, practice as I said. Um, the, the, the mixture is, um, it's funny, uh, my, my Indonesian is far from perfect. I made an Indonesian language test at the UI and it was not <laughs> that, <laughs> that high. But, <laughs> but um, I know that in some situations, people say, say to me, uh, uh, professors, for example, and I know a, a professor for art in Manu, he said, Ah, you speak so good Indonesian. I said, how can that come? Of course, you, there, is, um, there is no properly. It depends on the connection and you have to, to mm -hmm. practice. Practice is the thing. Mm -hmm. Because as I said in, in my presentation, one main, fo main, main point is you have to know a lot of things how to say it. It's not about mankua um, sai uh, bahasa. It's not about how to say, um, know, really know the language. This is for German, correct? More or less. But even then, if you speak high class german people will it can stuck the communication because people say this is not how you how you talk this is totally correct but this is you talking like a book some people say it's um, if you talk too too kaku too too stiff too too formally correct because um, communication is more communication is actually to know how mm -hmm. to say something in a certain situation so there is no no other chance and learn the ba you have to learn of course grammar and to learn vocabulary but then you have to start talking making mistakes and talking mm -hmm. okay okay we, we will go to the next question we have here an interesting question so uh, knowing that there are many differences in language system does it influence the mindset the language user has which includes perception how to behave etc Ya, yeah, so wie wie beeinflusst eigentlich uh, diese Fremdsprache, ja? unsere Denkweise, wie wir denken, wie wir etwas annehmen und so, ja. Es gibt natürlich viele Thesen dazu, also was sagen Sie dazu? Soll ich wieder anfangen? Ja. 
Yeah, I think if I hear a question like this, the, the main point, uh, not the main, the, the first thing I, I remember is um, um, uh, the, the political correct use of language, uh, which is maybe, I, I'm not sure about Indonesian, because Indonesian doesn't have these aspects of gender, for example, as I made an example with Dia. And I cannot really imagine the mindset of Indonesian if they hear a story, if he is really, what I said, not imagining the gender if he uh, listened to a story where suddenly someone says, uh, dann dia munchul, who is he? I think you always have an idea about a story and uh, what's going on. Okay, but uh, in Germany we have this discussion very, um, um, very intense in the moment. Um, uh, is, how is a, a gender neutral uh, language for example, they have to, um, if, if you make a low and culture, what means um, if you have uh, a job opportunity, uh, if, um, then you, you cannot write only male and female, but you also have to write now a, a neutral one or diverse, it's called, sorry, it's not neutral, it's uh, more than male and female or other than male and female. Um, I think if people living, people living uh, here, they are not here. For me, I speak personally. For me, it's sometimes, oh, oh God, of course, I should not try to, to um, um, I'd say, push down women when I say like this, when I say using the male form for everyone. No? But in the end, it's correct. The argumentation, I think, from, uh, from gender research or from feminists is correct that um, there is, um, the, for example, women uh, vanishes behind a, a male form in language. It's correct that you, with language you, you use power, you transport pictures. And the way how you use a language is of course expressing, um, not really how you think, but uh, enforcing a certain uh, um, uh, image, how uh, society, for example, is. That's my answer. Okay. Um, yes, we have a new uh, example in Germany and maybe worldwide. It's about the racial discussion about races. And we have in Berlin, for example, we have some areas with the uh, street names. And now it's a hard discussion whether we should change the street names as the, um, we have one word, it's not like Negro, but we have another word for these groups of black people. It's Mohren. And more and the more um, this um, black people who in former times lived in Germany, maybe a hundred years ago, and the connotation of words, that's uh, important, the connotation uh, that they express the mindset. So if you have a word and we have really strong discussions uh, to change some names of streets and so on, um, and um, even there are uh, voices who ask to change literature because, of course, if the, um, a novel was written a hundred years ago, they used the words that were usual a hundred and years ago. Uh, or, for example, the philosopher Kant is called a racist because he uh, follows the racial ideas of his time. And nowadays, um, yes, uh, shouldn't we read Kant anymore because he was a racist or what should we change? So uh, we have to consider the mindset and we uh, can examine the mindset in the works in because the works are in words. So it's the language. Um, so yes, the mindset expresses itself in words. That's um, the only thing we have to express ourselves. Ya, uh, terima kasih untuk uh, jawabannya. Uh, ya, tentunya menarik ya bagaimana bahasa digunakan, bagaimana bahasa mempengaruhi pola pikir ya. Uh, hmm. Kalau misalnya buat saya, uh, wow. dalam Jerman itu kata kerja letaknya paling belakang ya. Uh, paling belakang ditekan paling belakang. Dan itu mempengaruhi juga ternyata cara kita berpikir, cara kita membaca, cara kita bahkan cara kita melihat suatu benda tuh juga terpengaruh dari bahasa Jerman. Misalnya saya pernah salah naik uban, naik tram, karena yang dilihat hanya 
buntutnya nomor berapa padahal depannya ada sedikit perbedaan di situ waktu saya ingat jadi salah arah itu ternyata sejauh itu mempengaruhi uh, pola pikir kita begitu juga dalam bahasa Jerman ya tapi ya itu merupakan diskusi yang menarik juga tentunya oke okay, uh, saya punya satu pertanyaan juga ini tentang uh, dialog uh, bahasa Jerman itu kan digunakan di Jerman di Austria dan di Swiss ya uh, bagaimana sih uh, pelafalannya itu bisa dipahami oleh orang Jerman yang menggunakan bahasa Jerman tinggi ya so we 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 verstehen sie als deutsche also schweizer deutsch <laughs> uh, yes i know that uh, in switzerland uh-huh. today I, i will start this time uh, in switzerland they have extra classes for germans who want to work in switzerland Hmm. For example, we have a lot of um, a lot of uh, people from medical staff. They are working in Switzerland. But, uh, but, but they have to learn Switzerland as they would not understand the, the patients from Switzerland. And the patients would not understand maybe somebody coming from from Germany. Um, I think it's not that strange with Austria. Austrian dialects are much closer to our dialect, except in its a um, province in um, the western part, but quite close to to Switzerland. They have the Tyrol or Vorarlberg. It's really a very strange uh, dialect. For example, we have um, a meal called Speckknödel, and they say Speckknödel. So mm-hmm. we can't uh, guess this is the same word. So yes, um, but I think when I go to the, I'm from the northern part in Germany, when I go to the very southern part in Bavaria, um, and people from Bavaria are talking to each other in their dialect, I, yes, it must be very hard for me, and I probably wouldn't understand everything they were talking about. Ya, yeah. Ya, yeah, um, I have to admit, I never been to Swiss, so I don't know. <laughs> I um, I know that um, looking for the way of uh, of of, of uh, German as a language, which is not uh, not exclude not only for Germany. So they they made up this area. It's called Dach. It's a combination of D for mm-hmm. Germany, Deutschland, uh, R for Austria, and CH for Confederation Helvetica is for Swiss. Uh, so the languages where German is spoken, um, and this makes it actually difficult for language uh, German language learners because they say Germany is more than only German in uh, Germany. And for example, if you do a language test at the Goethe Institute. Uh, there's also an oral part where you ha- normally have someone calling at the phone. And I really say, pity the Indonesian students or the, the language learners who want to do the test because sometimes there's someone calling from Swiss. And even for me, it's difficult to, uh, to just to react and to understand a Swiss uh, a German, uh, uh, no, uh, Swiss German speaker on the phone. And uh, for me, it's already difficult to understand a German speaker on the phone sometimes because you have to focus on the topic and stuff and suddenly you have to focus also on the phonetics because it's a different pronounced. But that's the way it is. They made up this uh, language area. Um, so um, actually, if you have a little bit of uh, language feeling, you, you can feel it. I think Swiss, is, Swiss German is more difficult than Austrian. I would agree with, uh, with uh, Gabriela. And I, I don't know, in Tirol, I also haven't never been there, at least not in a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> ya, yeah, uh, memang meskipun sama-sama bahasa Jerman ya, tapi bahasa Jerman Swiss dengan bahasa Jerman Austria, dengan bahasa Jerman yang digunakan di Jerman sebagai bahasa formal itu, uh, perbedaannya cukup jauh ketika diucapkan ya. Secara tertulis mungkin perbedaannya masih bisa lumayan dikenali, tapi begitu diucapkan itu, uh, kita tuh, apa ya, terutama buat saya ya, buat saya orang yang belajar bahasa Jerman sebagai bahasa asing itu sangat jauh sekali perbedaannya. Uh, ya, kemudian uh, saya ingin ada satu pertanyaan lagi ya. Uh, 
seberapa baikkah kita menunjukkan apa ya kemampuan bahasa asing kita menggunakan uh, pelafalan yang baik. Maksudnya gini, kalau dalam bahasa Indonesia, kalau kita menggunakan bahasa Indonesia secara lancar dan baik, apakah itu bisa berakibat kontraproduktif juga terhadap komunikasi? Misalnya, ketika di Jerman, kalau kita menggunakan bahasa Jerman secara cepat, baik, kadang orang tidak menyesuaikan dengan kecepatan kita bicara. Oke, okay. soal ih. So di Fraga in Deutsch übersetzen ya. Ya, ya also ich habe mal schlechte Erfahrungen damit, also wenn ich schnell auf Deutsch rede, dann mm-hmm. versteht man, dass das ist schon gut in Deutsch bin, ja. Obwohl eigentlich noch nicht war. Ja, und das ist kontraproduktiv. Also was sagen Sie mm-hmm. zu dieser Situation? Ja, soll man immer zeigen, dass man gut in einer Sprache ist oder muss, muss man auch zeigen, dass man noch Schwierigkeiten hat? Uh, yes, I think uh, you have to show that you still have some difficulties. I had a similar experience when I talked to uh, the school of my son who uh, studied in, uh, in Scotland. Uh-huh. And I, of course, I prepared my phone call. And uh-huh. I, um, yes, I, I told them everything I intended to, told, to tell them. And I put my questions, which I prepared, of course. But then they answered as if I am almost a native speaker, but I didn't get the answer because I, I couldn't get what they were talking about. They had a Scotch accent um, as well, so it was really hard. And then I decided, yes, every time I will, I have to talk to them, I will, first I will talk very, very slowly. So they have to talk slowly to me. Um, and I, uh, yes, I, didn't prepare, yes, I prepared that well, but I hesitated to use some expressions to show them I'm not sure whether expressions are wrong or right. Um, yes, if you're not really experienced to communicate very, yes, like a mother tongue speaker very fast, then you have to slow down your language. That will help and give a sign to the other one that they have to slow down answering your questions, for example. Mm. Mm. Ya, Un, ya, okay. bagaimana Bapak Langut punya pengalaman juga dengan hal ini? Ya, yeah, I would I would totally agree. If you if you speak too good <laughs> and if you speak over your level, so then you get an answer which you probably don't understand. <laughs> so uh, sending a sign about the, the language level would be nice. But on the other side actually it's a challenge and um, I think you should not you should always be challenged because you, you know what I experience have in the other direction. I had a friend from uh, India. She spoke perfectly German, really, and we were on the train. And then suddenly there came the the, the conductor checking on the tickets, and she suddenly spoke like, "E next ticket." Ich. And as I looked at her and said, "Who is she? Why don't she speak normal?" And, uh, and she said. It's more easy if I don't speak good German, they just leave me alone. <laughs> <So> <laughs> you can use a, a, a lower language level, of, of course, so people don't bother you. Yeah. yeah, itu pengalaman yang sangat lucu ya. Saya juga pernah diceritakan uh, ayah saya. Uh, mereka waktu mereka sekolah di Australia, uh, temannya dihentikan oleh polisi. Kemudian karena melanggar sedikit lampu merah, uh, dia mengatakan dalam bahasa Inggris tapi bahasa Indonesia yang diterjemahkan ya. So me, me, I drive good, I drive good, uh, break not it, break not it, something like that. <laughs> Itu jadi polisinya akhirnya mengampuni kesalahan dia. Ternyata yeah. juga ada baiknya juga uh, trik-trik <laughs> ini digunakan ya. Oke. Okay. That's right. <laughs> Oke, okay. uh, saya ingin berterima kasih banyak uh, atas waktunya di jam kerja Ibu Otto, Bapak Swan Langut uh, berpartisipasi pada webinar yang kami selenggarakan. Uh, terima kasih banyak. Uh, tentu ini menyita banyak waktu Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Kita komunikasi sudah dari satu bulan lalu dan menyiapkan materi segala macam. Mudah-mudahan uh, dua jam ini menjadi dua jam yang mengesankan juga bagi teman-teman yang hadir di sini memberikan, memberikan kesan yang baik dan manfaat. Uh, kami mohon maaf sebelumnya tentu masih banyak kekurangan di sana-sini. 
uh, kami berusaha memperbaiki dan tentu mendengarkan juga uh, nasihat-nasihat yang masuk kepada kami. Uh, kami mengharapkan uh, Bapak-Bapak dan Ibu-Ibu sekalian uh, sukses untuk ke depannya semua tetap sehat, tetap semangat, dan hidup terasa lebih ringan daripada ekspektasi kita. Uh, sekarang uh, saya, Ari, saya uh, pamit undur diri dulu, tapi sebelumnya saya ingin memberikan dulu uh, alih kemudi webinar ini kepada rekan saya, Mas Dwi. Ya, silakan Mas Dwi atau Ibu Sonya. Ya, baik. Terima kasih, Bapak Ari, Muhammad Ari, Pak Kumonator. Baik, eh, demikian tadi Bapak Ibu serta webinar bahasa Departemen Teknik. Kita telah mendengarkan paparan dari kedua pembicara dan 